The Blue Island Experiences of a New Arrival Beyond the Veil Communicated by W. T. Stead Recorded by Pardo Woodman and Estelle Stead With a letter from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle London, 1922 Read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful B.C. A letter from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Dear Miss Stead, I found the narrative most interesting and helpful. I have no means of judging the exact conditions under which it was produced or how far subconscious influences may have been at work, but on the surface of it, Speaking as a literary critic, I should say that the clear expression and the happy knack of smiles were very characteristic of your father. We have to face the difficulty that the details of these various numerous descriptions of next spheres differ in various manuscripts, but, on the other hand, no one can deny that the resemblances far exceed the differences. We have to remember that the next world is infinitely complex and subdivided. In my father's house are many mansions, and that even in this small world, the accounts of two witnesses would never be the same. If a description were given by an Oxford don, and also by an Indian peasant, their respective stories of life in this world would vary much more than any two accounts that I have ever read of the world to come. I have specialized in that direction. The physical phenomena never interested me much, and I can hardly think that anyone has read more accounts printed, typed, and written than I have done, many of them from people who had no idea what the ordinary spiritualist scheme of things might be. In some cases, the mediums were children. Always there emerges the same idea of a world like ours, a world where all our latent capabilities and all our hidden ambitions have free and untrammeled opportunities. In all there is the same talk of solid ground, familiar flowers and animals, of congenial occupations, all very different to the vague and uncomfortable heaven of the churches. I confess that I cannot trace in any of these any allusion to a place exactly corresponding to the blue island, though the color blue is, of course, that of healing, and an island may be only an isolated sphere, the antechamber to others. I believe that such material details as sleep, nourishment, etc., depend upon the exact position of the soul in its evolution. The lower the soul, the more the material conditions. It is of enormous importance that the human race should know these things, for it not only takes away all fears of death, but it must, as in the case of your father, be of the very greatest help when one is suddenly called to the other side and finds oneself at once in known surroundings sure of one's future instead of that most unpleasant period of readjustment during which souls have to unlearn what their teachers here have taught and adapt themselves to unfamiliar facts. Good luck to your little book. 
Arthur Conan Doyle, Crowborough, Sussex, England, September 1922. Preface When in April 1912 the Titanic sank in mid-ocean and my father passed on to the next world, I was on tour with my own Shakespearean company. Amongst the members of that company was a young man named Pardo Woodman, who, on the very Sunday of the disaster, foretold it as we sat talking after tea. He did not name the boat or my father, but he got so much that pointed to disaster at sea, and the passing on of an elderly man intimately connected with me, that when the sad news came through, we realized he must have been closely in touch with what was about to happen. I mention this incident because it formed the first link between my father and Mr. Woodman, and as it is largely due to Mr. Woodman's psychic powers that my father has been able to get through the messages which are contained in this book, I think, therefore, it will be of interest to readers and should be put on record. Two weeks after the disaster, I saw my father's face and heard his voice just as distinctly as I heard it when he bade me good-bye before embarking on the Titanic. This was at a sitting with Etta Reed, the well-known American direct voice medium. At this sitting, I talked with my father for over twenty minutes. This may seem an amazing assertion to many, but it is a fact vouched for by all those who were present at the sitting. I put it on record at the time in an article published in Nash's magazine, which included the signed testimonies of all those present. From that day to this, I have been in constant touch with my father. I have had many talks with him, and communications from him containing very definite proof of his continued presence among us. I can truly say that the link between us is even stronger today than in 1912, when he threw off his physical body and passed on to the spirit world. There has never been a feeling of parting, although at first the absence of his physical presence was naturally a source of very great sadness. In 1917, Mr. Woodman was invalided out of the army and came to stay with us at our country cottage at Cobham. Whilst with us, the news came to him that his great friend had been killed at the front, and his interest in the possibility of communication with the next world, which had been indifferent until then, became intense, and he set out to find out for himself. It is ever the passing of a loved one that gives the necessary stimulus for eager inquiry. It was not long before his friend was able to give him definite proofs of his continued existence and of his ability to communicate. His first proofs were given through Vout Peters and were followed by others through Gladys Osborne Leonard's mediumship and through the mediumship of friends gifted with psychic powers. I was present at that first sitting with Mr. Peters. Father was there also, and his friend said it was due to my father's presence and help that he was able to succeed so well in these first attempts at communication. 
Shortly after this, Mr. Woodman found that he himself had the power of automatic writing, and Father and others were soon able to write through him. Father always prefers me to be present. As if I am not, he seems to have more difficulty, and very rarely will attempt writing. He explains the necessity of my presence in this way. He and I are so much en rapport, and so closely in touch with each other, that he's able to draw much power from me. I act as the connecting link, and form a sort of battery between him and Mr. Woodman. I merely sit passively while Mr. Woodman writes. Certainly I see a light around us, and a strong ray of light concentrating on Mr. Woodman's arm. Sometimes I am able to see Father himself, and always, when he is writing, I feel his presence very distinctly. We have received many messages in this way. For a while, in 1918, we sat regularly every week, and were kept in touch with much that was going on at the front, and about what was about to happen, and were advised of occurrences often days before the news came through in the ordinary way. In one case, Father gave us the actual headlines which would, and did, appear in the papers the following week. It is interesting, also of importance to note, that Mr. Woodman and my father met only once before the passing of the latter. I introduced Mr. Woodman to him not long before he left England on the Titanic, and they only exchanged two or three words. Therefore Mr. Woodman never knew my father personally, nor has he come into touch with his writings or with his work in any way, and yet the wording and the phrasing of the messages are my father's, and even the manner of writing is typical of him. Mr. Woodman also writes with his eyes closed, and often holds a handkerchief over them. Some of the best messages were given in the twilight, when it was impossible for me to follow what was being written, and yet the words were never overwritten. The writing will stop sometimes, while Father evidently reads over what has been written, and alterations will be made, I's dotted and T's crossed correctly. It was a habit of my father's while here, to go back over his copy and cross his T's and dot his I's. This habit was only known to a few and was certainly absolutely unknown to Mr. Woodman. Two of the messages, obtained in this way, have already been published. They were given by my father for Armistice Day, 1920, and Armistice Day, 1921. For the first, we had no idea he contemplated giving a message. A few friends, including Mr. Woodman, were taking tea with my mother and myself on the Sunday before the 11th of November. We had been chatting on various subjects when suddenly I felt my father come into the room and could tell by the feeling he gave me that he wished us to give him an opportunity to write and that it was urgent. It was impossible to arrange for that evening, so we made an appointment for the evening following. Mr. Woodman came about nine o'clock. We sat chatting by the fire for a few minutes. Then we felt Father come in, and we sat at once. Father's manner was exactly as it used to be when here in the body, and he wanted to get something important done. He must concentrate on that and on nothing else. 
Directly, we sat, Mr. Woodman's hand began to move, and Father wrote words to this effect. I have my message ready, and if you do not interrupt, I hope to succeed in getting it through. He wrote at tremendous speed, and in about half an hour had given his message. Having finished, he gave directions that it should be read through and punctuated, if necessary. Then he left us not a word about anything else. It was a strenuous half-hour for us all, but it was worth it. The message was printed the next day, and many thousands distributed to those visiting the cenotaph that year. The 1921 message was given in the same manner, and thousands of copies of the two messages, now printed in pamphlet form, were distributed on Armistice Day 1921. It was soon after, giving this last message, that Father expressed the wish that we should sit for the messages given in this book. We had felt for some time that he was wanting us to sit for a series of messages, but asked that if this were so, he could give us definite instructions to this effect from an outside source. This he did by asking Mrs. Kelway Bamber, the author of Claude's Books, at a sitting which she was having with Mrs. Leonard, to tell us that it was quite true. He did wish us to sit for a series of messages, which, he said, would tell of his arrival and some of his experiences on the other side. Both Mr. Woodman and I are busy people, and can only give what spare time we have from our ordinary work to psychic matters so that it was difficult to fit in times. Therefore, it was a few months before we had finished taking the messages. These were all given in the manner already described. They were consecutively, but definite instructions were not given as to how the whole series was to be arranged. Father's foreword explains his object in writing this book, so there's no need to dwell on that here. When he started, he had a rather longer book in view, but decided in favor of a short book, as it is more likely to be read. It can be published at a reasonable price, and so stand the chance of reaching more people. All who worked with my father here will know that such reasoning was characteristic of him. The photograph given as frontispiece to this volume was taken by the Crew Circle at Crew in the autumn of 1915. In the spring of that year, I had met Mr. Hope and Mrs. Buxton at the house of a mutual friend in Glasgow, and they, very kindly, invited me to call and see them in crew if I should ever have an opportunity to do so. Soon after my return to London, Father asked me to arrange to go to crew. As he said, he wanted to try to give us his picture on the same plate with mine. Accordingly, I arranged to spend a weekend with some friends at Crewe, and have some sittings with Mr. Hope and Mrs. Buxton. I bought a box of plates in London and took them with me, and I can truthfully say that that box of plates never left my sight or my possession all the time I was there. I even slept with that box clasped tightly in my hands. We had our first sitting on the Saturday when I obtained two extras, neither resembling my father. One was of interest because it was the picture of a lady who had appeared on a plate with my father when he was experimenting with Mr. Borsnell in the nineties. 
I took my box, containing the rest of the plates, away with me after the sitting, bought another box of plates in crew, took both boxes with me to the sitting on the Sunday. We did not use my box first at all in the sitting, and I kept it all the while just inside my dress. We sat around the table, putting our hands over and under the second box for a few minutes. I then held the box for a minute against Mrs. Buxton's forehead. After this, I was instructed by Mr. Hope's guide to take the box myself into the dark room. Note that the box had not been unsealed or the plates exposed to the light. When in the dark room, I was to unseal the box and take out two bottom plates, taking particular care to note which was the bottom plate, and then to develop both plates. Mr. Hope was to come in with me, but not to touch the box or the plates. I carried out the instructions. I found the bottom plate not even fogged, and on the other plate, two messages, one from Archdeacon Colley, deploring father's inability to write, one from Mr. Walker, the father of my host, and in one corner of the plate a faint outline of my father's face. When I got back to my friends that evening, we had a sitting at which Father expressed his keen disappointment at his failure to give his picture. It's all my fault, he said. I am so excited at the idea of getting my picture beside yours after I have been so-called dead for so many years that I break the conditions. However, many have promised to help me tomorrow, and if I fail again, we have something else prepared to slip on, so that you will not be quite so disappointed. On the following morning, I went for my last sitting. Two of my own plates were used. On both of these are pictures of my father. One is reproduced in this book. The other is a large face of father which completely covers me. Now, having, I hope, given a little idea as to how these messages were obtained and our reasons for feeling that they do indeed come from my father, I am content to let the Blue Island do the rest. I am sure it will interest many, and if it awakens some, to a truer realization of what is to come, and makes them seek for further definite proofs themselves, then the three chiefly concerned in giving these messages to the public my father, Mr. Woodman, and myself, will be amply satisfied. Estelle W. Stead, September 1922 End of Preface